All right. In this video, I want to talk about the rapture, but as it is depicted in the Old Testament. So, let's get into that. First instance we see is in Genesis chapter 5 with Enoch. It says at verse 24 of Genesis chapter 5, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And this is before the flood. Enoch, one man taken up before destruction, to judgment, wrath of God. Right? It's in a time of peace and plenty. Everybody's just going about their business. And then all of a sudden, one man's taken, one man's left. One woman's left, one woman's taken. Right? But it's depicted as one man because the body of Christ is one body. That's exactly why we see just John being taken up in Revelation chapter 4. Because he's representing the church, one body. Uh, a lot of people just kind of dismiss this. It's like, why is Enoch mentioned in the Bible? Why does it talk about him and about him walking with God and being taken before the flood? Why is this story even said? It's because it's telling you about the rapture. That's why. Let's come over to Genesis chapter 19 where Jesus tell, tells us that the end is going to be like the days of Lot. And what happened in Lot's time? Well, the angels came and they told Lot he had to get out of the city because they can't do anything until he's taken out. And then when he's taken out of the city, Sodom and Gomorrah, representing the earth, it is destroyed by the wrath of God. Right? That's a depiction of the rapture. And Lot, a depiction of grace, because he wasn't a perfect, upright, holy man. He's considered a righteous man because he's righteous in the eyes of God, because he's a believer. But outside of that, he was willing to give up his daughters to be raped by a gang of guys who wanted to rape the angels that were visiting him. And then he, after he's eaten even taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he ends up getting drunk twice and sleeping with both of his daughters and getting them pregnant. Granted, it was his daughter's ideas, but if he wasn't getting just blackout drunk, it wouldn't be an issue. So, here we see a depiction of the church where we're imperfect and even worldly, but we believe and are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, made righteous in the eyes of God, because we're considered dead, and the life we live is considered Jesus' life. Jesus died for us, and now we have his life. We're righteous. Perfect depiction using this fellow Lot to show that. Then we come over to Joseph. Joseph is a really good one, because Joseph depicts Jesus. And, whoops, uh, we see that Joseph is sold by his brothers, betrayed, just like Jesus betrayed by his brothers, the, his fellow Jews, namely Judas. And he's given over and put to death. Joseph didn't die, but it was believed he is dead. And the coat of many colors is covered in blood and given to the father so that he can decide for himself and think that Joseph is dead. And this is a depiction of Jesus being betrayed and giving up the ghost and his blood being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And Joseph becomes second in command of Egypt, in Egypt representing the world. And he's second to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh would represent the father. But J Joseph, representing Jesus, basically does everything. He's in control of everything. And he runs everything. And he gets this position after interpreting the Pharaoh's dream. And tells him about the two dreams and how they're the same dream. There's going to be seven years of plenty and then there's going to be a seven year famine. And in this time of plenty, 
Joseph marries a Gentile woman. That's the name here I have highlighted here. And he has two sons by her. This is showing Jesus marrying a Gentile woman before the seven-year tribulation. And then we have the seven years of famine representing the time of Jacob's trouble. It has to do with the Jews, where the Jews are now brought to Jesus. They don't recognize him as a brother, as a fellow Jew. Right? They see Jesus as the Gentile God. Right? They don't realize Jesus is their God, their Messiah. And it is revealed to them in this time of famine that Jesus is their Messiah. And then they accept him. Then we come over here to Joshua chapter 2. And we have Rahab welcoming them the spies. And she puts a red like scarf or what have you in her window representing the blood of Jesus. And her and her family are taken out of Jericho before it's burned down and destroyed. So I think there's a depiction of that going on right here where she's letting the spies out. So she is a Gentile woman and she ends up being in the line of the Messiah, uh, showing you the church, right? We have all these stories. There's probably a lot more that I haven't seen. And you can be finding them yourself if you were getting into the Bible and reading it. But anyway, we got 2 Kings chapter 2 where they knew that Elijah was going to be taken up to heaven. And he's taken up by a whirlwind. And Elijah, and there's Elisha. So there's a, a, with a J and an S. I'll highlight it here, just in case you're not familiar. There's two prophets, Elijah with a J, and Elisha with an S. And Elisha wants a double portion of the spirit that is given to Elijah, but the only way he's going to get it is if he actually witnesses Elijah being taken up. And he's taken up in a whirlwind. And I think that's what's trying to be depicted in this little picture on the side of this. I'm not sure, but I'm assuming. It doesn't look too much like a whirlwind, but it does look like a flaming chariot. Trying to be a whirlwind going on there, but anyway. Uh, so they know when he's going to actually go up. And Elisha witnesses it, and he receives a double portion of the spirit. Uh, this is a depiction of the church going up, and the latter rains coming down for Israel, the Jews, the 144,000, the two witnesses. And they know that the church is going up. They know that Elijah is going up, that he's going to be raptured. It's not something that's a secret that nobody knows about. You know, maybe some people don't believe it, but everybody's talking about it. Elijah going up and it happens. And it would be a good study to figure out what time of the year this happened. It'd be very interesting to study that out. I've heard some people talk about it, but I, I'm not too sure. But that would be really cool to find out because... I imagine it has to do with something I'm going to bring up as I go through here, the Feast of Trumpets. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's around the time that he was going up. But, can't say for sure. And we have Nehemiah chapter 8. This is one that I was actually reading at the laundromat this morning. And I was like, wow, uh, this is a depiction of the rapture going on here. Of course, you can read on more, but I want to just focus on the first couple verses here to paint the picture of what is going on here. And it says in Nehemiah 8 at verse 1, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. All right, there's your key here is one man. That's a depiction of Enoch and John and even Elijah. One man going up as a depiction of one body, the body of Christ being raptured. I know this is just going into the street, but listen to what is said. Uh, as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake 
unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which, will, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now the first day of the seventh month is the day and the hour no man knows. It's the Feast of Trumpets. And the reason why no one knows the day of the hour is because no one knows exactly when the new moon is going to be seen. Right? So, this day is not really known for sure. And that's what makes it interesting. And we can see that they gather as one man on the Feast of Trumpets. And as they're read the Book of the Law, they're actually sad. And it talks about them crying and weeping. If I could see where that actually says down here. Might be down a couple more. Yeah, down here it tells them, uh, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard. And you can imagine why they would weep if they were just raptured. And you know that you could have done better. And you know that family and friends are here on earth. They didn't come up with you. And he tells them to eat the fat and to drink the sweet and, and to enjoy. Because the joy of the Lord is their strength. Uh, this is them being taken up. And the reason why the law is being read is because it's the marriage. And they're basically having the vows being read and the I do's. And that's what you can see going on right here in Nehemiah 8. And now we have another depiction of the rapture here in Daniel chapter 3. Where Daniel is representing the actual church. He's uh, close to the king. Uh, he's earned his spot there by interpreting the king's dreams and prophesying. Uh, but that's, you know, I wouldn't say earned, but more by the grace of God, because God revealed to him the, the dream and the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So he ends up being put in a high position over the wise men of the king's people. And Nebuchadnezzar decides to make a golden image of himself. And everybody has to bow down and worship it when they hear the sound of the music from all the instruments. And during this time, of course, Daniel's not going to bow to the statue. But Daniel's nowhere mentioned. But his three friends, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think that's their actual Babylonian names. I can't remember their Jewish names. It's like uh, Mikkel... Uh, I can't remember the other two. So we're just going to go with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they didn't bow. And, of course, those are three Jewish boys or men. I'm not quite sure how old they were at the time. And they were thrown into the fire, but they weren't burned up. God was with them during this trial. And they made it out alive. But the two people, the guards, who threw them in... They died by just getting close to the furnace, uh, which is interesting. But we can see here Daniel representing the church where during this time of Jacob's trouble of the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, where everybody has to bow and worship, like we read in Revelation chapter 12, that hey, everybody's made to worship the image of the beast, and if they don't, they're going to die, that this time is for the Jews and Daniel representing the church is not there. Daniel is protected being up with the king represented by Nebuchadnezzar. Right? And then we have Zephaniah chapter 2. And at verse 2, it says, Before the decree bring forth, 
before the day pass as chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So we can see here from this verse, it's depicting this time of Jacob's trouble, the decree. The day that passes as the chaff, the fierce anger of the Lord, the Lord's anger is going to come upon the world here. It says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now we know what day this is talking about. Well, let's compare a little bit here. In Isaiah 26, it says at verse 19, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. See the body of Christ going on here. And it's actually talking about the same thing here as I'll show you. Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. So here we see... The dead being raised with Jesus' body. It's the church. They're going into the chambers, the marriage chambers. And as Jesus says, his father's house has many mansions. If it wasn't so, he would tell us. And he's preparing a mansion for us. So we're each going to have our own place. And that's where we're going to be while the indignation comes. The, God's wrath comes upon the inhabitants of the earth which is exactly what we have read here. But you need to seek judgment, righteousness, meekness. You see, there's a lot of people who will admit that, you know, they have sinned. And Jesus died for their sins. But they lack the meekness because they believe that they have to actually be like God and keep the law perfectly in order to either get saved, keep their salvation, prove their salvation. And if they don't do this, they are going to be a castaway and God's going to toss them aside and they're going to fall and go into damnation. But you see, that's why it says judgment, righteousness and meekness. So you need to eat that humble pie and not just admit that you have sinned. But that you're a sinner. And that means that not only have you sinned, but you continue to sin. We all continue to sin. And we need to all admit this, that we are sinners. And when you realize that, you really grasp the judgment that's been put upon you, that you don't deserve heaven, you deserve hell. And the righteousness is that God loves us. He's not against us. He's for us. So Jesus came into the world, lived a perfect life, it died in spite of that. But he died for us, for our sins. That's God's mercy. We don't get what we deserve. Jesus gets what we deserve. And then the righteousness is that in exchange, because this is a marriage thing, right? The church gets married to God. They become one flesh. He takes on ours and he dies for us. And then he gives us his, which was perfect, his perfect life is righteousness and in order to really accept this you have to believe the gospel and part of believing the gospel is at first admitting the truth of you being a sinner and that you continue to sin and you can't save yourself but a lot of people don't want to eat that humble pie they want to just basically hand over their sin to Jesus and that's it but you see, God's going to give you everything himself. You have to give up everything, not just the sin, but the good with the bad. Your past, present, and future, your whole life so that Jesus can take it and die. And he's going to give you something better, his life. Even if you like your life and you like what's good about your life, it ends. All the good stuff ends. And eventually you die. Humble yourself 
and give it all over. Well, let's uh, continue on after just giving the gospel to you there. I think I already brought Isaiah 26 up, didn't I? Oh yeah, I was just talking about this. It's time to move on to Song of Solomon here. In chapter 2 at verse 10, it says, I guess we could start at verse 8, but I wanted to cut it down a little bit here. Try to narrow the focus on this. Verse 10, it says, uh, My beloved spake and, I, and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter's past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with her tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Here we get a depiction of winter's over, spring is over, the rains. We're in the summertime. And there's a harvest going on to the figs and the grapes. And we know that's when the end is, that the harvest, there's a first fruits. The church is being taken up. This would be Feast of Trumpets time. We see more connection to this time. I think in a couple passages I brought up here. In Micah 7, at verse 1, it says, Woe is me, for I am as when they had have gathered the summer fruits. See, we see here summer fruits here. As the grape gleanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the fir first ripe fruit. Right, the first fruits going on here. The good man is perished out of the earth. See, raptured. And there is none upright among men. Rapture. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. This is how it's going to be after the rapture. He's talking about woe, right? Because of the summer fruits, desires the first fruits, but the fruits, they're gone. The good men, the upright, the righteous, they've been taken up. They're gone. Compared here to Malachi chapter 3 at verse 17, and it says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him, because we're one body with Jesus. So he spares us as he's sparing Jesus. Then shall ye return, this is after the rapture, and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Because given to the church is judgment to judge all things. And this is actually what I wanted to compare to right here in Isaiah 57. It says, The righteous perish, and no man layeth it to heart. Rapture going on here. And the merciful men are taken away, not considering the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. And that's exactly what's going to happen. People are going to get raptured, and a lot of people are not going to have it click. They're going to think something horrible happened. Uh, either, you know, some weird dimensional rip, they'll say, that had to do with CERN, and these people were gone into another dimension, some kind of time warp. Or even say aliens took them. Something horrible happened. And they're not going to consider that it's the righteous the merciful men are taken away and that they're taken away because of the evil that has to come. They're being protected. They're not going to catch it. And we see how that connects over to here with the good man perish. There's none upright. And it's right at the summer fruits. As we see here, they're going to be spared as his own son is spared. And then they're going to come back, right? They return. They're being spared from something, and then they return. So to be spared, they're being taken out of the way for them to return. And then they judge. And I just wanted to add a couple of psalms here to end this. Uh, psalms 27, it says at verse 5, For in the time of trouble, 
Jacob's trouble. He shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. We see the secret of his tabernacle. He has a tabernacle in heaven, the temple in heaven. That's where we're going to be hidden because we are stones that build up his temple. And even some of us will be pillars in his temple, as he says in Revelation chapter 3. Might be chapter 2, but I'm pretty sure it's chapter 3. And he set me upon the rock, which is Jesus. And then Psalm 57, verse 1 here, uh, skipping the part about who is the, the author and stuff. It says, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Just a couple of passages that when you compare to what we just went over, we see this going on here. Jesus coming for his bride. And it's uh, not far away. And I realized something is that having the this, I guess you could say, desire and compulsion to make a video like this, I'm not expecting to convince people that the rapture is imminent or that the pre-trib rapture is true. Uh, what I've realized is sometimes in preaching, you're not preaching to convince others and to convert them. You're preaching as a witness that God loves them and cares about them and warned them and told them ahead of time so that when they're judged, they don't have an excuse. They can't say, well, nobody told me. I didn't know this. Or, you know, they have nothing. Right? So it's all laid out there. They can't hide in bullshit God. Everything's there. All can see what happened. And, uh, yeah, so, I know a lot of people who believe the rapture, they're going to be like, this is awesome, I get to see it depicted out in the Old Testament a bit here, it may make you want to look and see what other gems are out there, I'm sure there's more, and if there is, I'll end up putting it together, make a part two to this, I guess, but, uh, I think for the most part, it's just to be a testimony to those who mock and when it happens, then either they'll believe, at which point the gospel of grace is gone. You can't be part of the church anymore, but you can still be saved. But like Jesus said at this time, as talking to the Jews, that whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever will lose his life for Jesus' sake will save it on to eternal life. That means you're going to have to give up everything during this time. You're going to have to give up your schooling, your career, and social status your business, uh, your money, uh, family, and friends. You have to give up uh, your own health. You have to give up everything because that's what it's going to cost so that you can actually be saved and ultimately probably death. And you're just going to have to do that so that you can still be saved who cares if you're not part of the church or not? It's better to be saved than as part of the kingdom of God than it is to be on the other end, right? But, uh, yeah, I had to add that just in case because I know there's some people who teach grace and that the church goes through the tribulation. And a lot of people think that, well... You're saved by grace, well then you can take the mark of the beast because you don't deserve it, you haven't earned it. It's not about what I do or don't do and say and don't say. So I can take the mark of the beast and God knows that I'm doing this so I can take care of myself and my family. And that's not how it is. At this time, it's grace is gone. You're going to have to earn it. And that means you're going to have to deny yourself to the point of death because you've already denied grace. You've had your chance. You're getting a chance right now, and you may be rejecting it. So, that's on you. You know, this is a testimony to show that somebody told you. It's not God's fault. You lack the humility to, to take it and run with it. So, 
Thanks for watching and take care.